very good evening to one and all present in this uh, second part two virtual meeting of uh, fear of public speaking and uh, i am very happy to let you all know that uh, today again we have with us a great personality mr uh, vince stevenson last time he delivered a talk on fear of public speaking and uh, those who join today i would like to uh, welcome all of them including the other participants and i request all the participants uh, to join me to welcome mr wins who has uh, uh, means agreed to deliver the talk today and he will be teaching us about different vocal development uh, exercises today so uh, first of all i am really uh, expressing my sincere thanks to uh, mr stevens uh, sir who has kindly accepted our invitation and agreed to deliver talk on the fear of public speaking those who have joined today they may not be aware about him so i'll just uh, brief about him again today vince stevenson uh, he is very well known as the fear doctor a speaker trainer and author he is a well known speaker trainer who has won several awards for leadership education and development he is a founder of the college of public speaking london and works as education director managing all aspects of co course delivery and content means he is also one of the uk's leading speech coaches he is involved in teaching and training people not only in uk but around the world uh, if i just uh, go on telling about him i think one day will not be enough because uh, i personally uh, know sir and uh, he has a, a really a great uh, you can say he is a very great personality and uh, he has lot of uh, things to learn and uh, i really i uh, feel myself fortunate enough to be in his touch and i i always get a lot of knowledge training from him so thank you very much sir for joining today and uh, on behalf of all the participants and my own behalf uh, from my bottom of heart i welcome you to this uh, program sir uh, before i hand over uh, to you i would like to just uh, brief about the last session which we discussed and uh, where you delivered uh, about on the uh, different aspects related to speech consideration where you clearly mentioned about the uh, what should be the format of a speech date of uh, duration or title and uh, what is the event you should consider when we are going to deliver a speech or talk and uh, you also uh, means uh, threw light on uh, Uh, some other aspects like what is the content of his speech what is your relationship to the subject matter does this have an impact on his speech tone who is the audience does the speech have one key or uh, recurring message what is the purpose of speech whether it is for info to informing uh, to inform people educate people motivate or inspire or entertain uh, are there any preferred stories and you talked many more and uh, um you educated us so really uh, we got lot of things uh, to learn in the last session and uh, today we are going to have another session and i'm 100% sure that today the session is going to be very wonderful so thank you very much sir now i request you to please take over and continue the session over to you sir okay thank you dp uh, once again for that lovely introduction sometimes i don't recognize myself when i when i hear you uh, those words are very very kind okay so last week one of the one of the questions was uh, how do, how do we how do we manage the jitters how do we make those words flow the way we want them to flow and last week i was very much focused on the objects really of of creating a speech designing your speech planning your speech this week we're going to look at some vocal techniques and these are techniques that i've been using for a number of years i remember when i first became a trainer i had a very thin voice i think my voice is a lot thicker now it's a lot stronger it's more resonant it was a little bit more high pitched in those days but the good news is that if you if you're unhappy with your voice there are things that you can do 
to make your voice better, to strengthen the voice. And can you hear me, DP? It's got a bit funny. Yeah, but here. it is going, sir. I think just now it started. Now it's okay. 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 So it's yeah, again. so we get a lot of feedback, which we didn't have ten minutes ago, which is unfortunate. Okay. So today, what we're going to do? We're going to have some fun, and what's going to be important is that you're going to be doing a lot more work than just listening. Last week was very much about listening. This week is going to be much more about interaction and both myself and DP will be asking you to participate in many of the exercises, in fact, all of the exercises. Because the only way... That... Uh, sorry to interrupt. The voice is going. Uh, so one you can mute, I think. In... Yeah, I think I muted the... Uh... Because of my side, let me. Oh, how's that? Ah, it's fine, sir. Okay. Yeah, right. it's it's fine. No, it's not. Even. Right. I don't know what happened there. Okay, let's just very quickly do the introduction again. So what I was saying was that uh, last week I, I told you a lot about speech making, planning, uh, preparation, and practice, and uh, but one of the questions, one of the key questions was. How do you get those words out when you're when you're in that moment? Where do you find those words? And what I propose to do today is to share with you a number of exercises that I found incredibly useful that have helped me become a better speaker, a more fluent speaker. And I think when I was a young man, I was very tied to my notes, and that 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 made the delivery very stilted. So what I find these days is it's a lot easier when I just trust myself that generally I know what I want to say, how those words come out in the moment. I trust myself and generally they come out okay. Sometimes if I don't think it's okay, I'll come back and I'll say, let me just reiterate that point. Let me just say that again. And then it will come out slightly different, but more accurate to, to what I was planning in the first place. So the first thing you've got to do, I think, is, is really, as I said last week, really understand your material, go through your material as, as best you can, and really know what are the key points that you want to deliver. Uh, it's amazing that those words generally, you'll be able to find them when you need them. So that's, that's the good news. So these exercises that we're gonna be doing today are fun. We're gonna start off with some breathing exercises, which I think are incredibly useful. And then we're going to do, we're going to run through some documents that I've sent to DP. And again, we've got far too much material and we'll, we'll just cherry pick some of what I believe to be the best exercises. And then I'll, I'll try and demonstrate them to you. And then I'll ask you, I'll give you like 30 seconds to try that exercise yourself at home. So good luck. And, uh, the most important thing here, when, we, when we're exploring the voice, when we're developing the voice, I want you to have fun. And sometimes you might make some very funny noises or noises that you weren't expecting uh, from your mouth. And that's okay. That's all part of the process. It's all part of learning and it's all part of the fun. And uh, I may ask you to sing later. And I'm not a great singer, but I'll, I'll demonstrate just what a bad singer I am. But the most important thing is to recognize that sometimes the voice breaks. When you're moving between notes, the voice breaks. And those are areas where you want your voice to be strengthened. Because if you think of your voice as a wave of sound, which is exactly what it is, by the way, uh, if you listen to really good singers, when they move from one note to another, you can't really, you can tell the difference, but it, may, it, it runs so smoothly. It's like a, a beautiful car when you change gears up. Uh, you don't feel it. And that's what great singers do. They do that very, very well. They make it look and sound effortless. When we find that we have breaks in our voice, that suggests those, those are areas within uh, the octaves that, uh, that we need to work on. And don't think, oh my gosh, I'm a terrible singer or I can't do this exercise. The whole point is if you're not getting the, the required outcomes that you're looking for, that's the suggestion. That's something where you really need to work on. So don't worry too much about that. 
So we're going to start off, we're going to talk about breathing because, uh, again, unfortunately last week there wasn't, just wasn't time to talk about everything that we could talk about. So breathing for me is like the cornerstone of public speaking. And the only time that you can breathe when you're speaking is when you pause. So just think a few moments ago, I was speaking quite quickly and in an, in an animated way. Now I'm just slowing things down. And when I'm slowing things down, that gives me the opportunity to breathe. breathe. And the idea is that when you pause, breathe silently through your nose, in through the nose, and then as you speak, that you, that's what we call the exhalation breath. So you breathe in through your nose and you talk out through your mouth, in through your nose and out through your mouth. And if you've ever done any yoga or any breathing exercises of that type, in through the nose and out through the mouth. So it's like a process and you want it to work really smoothly. So in through the nose and out through the mouth. The, the design that we're looking for effectively is that whether we have a very small sentence, a short sentence, a medium length sentence or a long sentence, you need the oxygen and the energy to convey that line in the way that you want to. And towards uh, the end of today's session, I'll just do some text reading with you and I'll try to demonstrate and illustrate exactly what I mean there. And I'll, I'll do a little bit of Shakespeare for you. Uh, not too many lines, but just a few lines just to demonstrate because if you can take the words of somebody else, you know, somebody famous, you know, an actor or a film writer, if you take those words and deliver them with the same energy and authority, there's no reason why you can't do it with your own voice when you're talking about your own subject matter. So this is where actors uh, have a great life in it to, to, many, to a large extent. And that is the first year, if you, if you ever chose to become an actor, the first year of an actor's course is all about developing the voice because that's the tool that you're going to be working with for the rest of your life. So to be able to rely on that tool, to be able to develop it so that it will achieve the outcomes consistently that you're always looking for, that is the desired objective, to make your voice the tool because it's your, it's your tool of expression. And as an actor, you're going to be taking other people's words and expressing them. But, but the actors talk about creating a truth. And what they mean by that is that, you know, when you go to the theatre uh, and you pay for your ticket, you know that what you're watching on stage is not real. It's actors acting. But what, what makes great art and great theatre is that when you watch those, those people on stage acting, you believe in what they're doing and you suspend your disbelief and it looks like it's real. So this is what actors mean when they talk about creating the truth. They're trying to create something that you know isn't real, that they know isn't real, but to make it look like it's real. Now, the good news is uh, when we're speaking is that generally it's, uh, well, we talked about speech making last week. Uh, if you're the speech writer, if you're the speech deliverer, You've got to find your own words, your own messages. Generally, you're working on your own. You don't have any uh, colleagues like actors do, the rest of the cast to help them, and you're not doing it under direction. So to a large extent, when you're a speaker, you're doing all of this on your own. You don't have any direction. You have to trust your instincts. And at first, certainly when I was a young man, I found that rather difficult. And I spent a lot of time looking for mentors, people that I believed in, people that I could trust in. Now, I'm talking about 35, 40 years ago, which is clearly pre-internet, and finding those kind of mentors was particularly uh, difficult. Uh, there were some great books. There was the um, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. That was probably the first sort of management book I read a long, long time ago about improving uh, your speech and influencing people. So that's a great book if, you, if you've got a chance to, uh, to read that. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna ask you to, to do some, just some very simple breathing exercise and, I, and I'll talk you through the breathing process because uh, this is really very, it's vitally important. 
one thing I'm going to ask you to do, if you've got a colleague or a friend at home there, probably you shouldn't have, hopefully you've got a friend or a partner, have some water, have a glass of water handy. Ask if you can have a glass of water. If you are two to three percent dehydrated, that can affect your concentration by up to 40 percent. And uh, in England, we have motorways. And when we're driving, there are signs on the motorway and it says, stop, take a break, save, you know, prevent accidents. Because most accidents on the motorway are created by people losing concentration. Motorways are virtually hypnotic. You can drive for miles and miles and miles and not recognize or see anything, but you're driving kind of consciously, unconsciously. And if you lose concentration, it's very easy to have an accident. So if you're, um, if you're properly hydrated, now the interesting thing is if you're gonna make a speech, let's say you're making a speech in 15 minutes, have a glass of water, 15 minutes before you make your speech because that's how long it will take to rehydrate your brain cells. Brain cells are slightly different from other cells in your body. So by drinking uh, 15 minutes before a glass of water, uh, that will help you. That will help your concentration and keep you on track. So that's a good thing. It's a very simple tip. Now, the other thing we need to know, we do, I just want to talk to you a little bit about anatomy and physiology, because this is really important for, for breathing. And because when we breathe in, you know, you breathe in about 20% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, and about 1% inert gases. So oxygen is the key to life. We need oxygen. Now, regrettably, uh, people have accidents, um, and, uh, you know, in England and all over the world. And uh, cyclists, particularly, uh, if, 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 you, if, you, if they're involved in a road traffic accident and they're not wearing a helmet and they bang their head on the, you know, on the concrete floor, uh, it's not looking good. It's really not looking good for them. Uh, if your oxygen levels go from 20% down to 17%, Really, that's that's the end of the game. So this is where this we, we used to call it the kiss of life. They call it recovery breaths. Now, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you need to breathe oxygen into somebody, I, this always confused me. Why? Why do we breathe? So generally, we talk about when we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Now, that's true. But we, you only breathe out 4% carbon dioxide and you breathe out 16% uh, oxygen. So you're still getting 16% oxygen into that person. So just think about how fragile life is on this planet. If, if oxygen levels fell to 17% or less, that's, that's the end of the game for everybody. So really think about oxygen because we need to get that oxygen into our bloodstream and we need to get it up to your brain. Now, interesting facts about the brain. So I weigh about 88 kilos and my brain weighs about 1.4 kilos, as does yours. And my brain uses 20% of my body's oxygen. So you mass it's a massively disproportionate amount of oxygen that your brain uses. Your brain effectively is your command and control center. It's, it's hooked up to your central nervous system and through the central nervous system to every cell in your body. So there's a direct connection and we have these things called biofeedback loops. So your brain is constantly monitoring everything that's happening inside your body. And what creates a really, really good rhythm is effective breathing. So we need breathing for life and we need really good breathing for public speaking as well. So I'd like to do some, so we'd like to start off with some simple breathing exercises with you. So what I'd like you to do is just sit up straight. If you're sitting down, that's good. Or if you're standing up, that's fine. But just sit up straight. Put your hands on your lap. Put your feet nice and flat on the floor. And we're going to take a, a breath in. And it's going to be about five seconds. So deep breath in. And you should feel your chest and your ribs rise. And you just hold that for five seconds or so. And then when we exhale, we're going to exhale through our mouth. 
we're going to purse our lips and we're going to go Now, generally, when we talk about taking a deep breath, what's really effective, we don't want to take a gulp. We don't want to go, <gasps> that's not helpful um, for public speaking or breathing generally. So when we breathe, we want to breathe smoothly and rhythmically. So in through the nose. Hold it for five. And exhale. In through the nose, hold it and exhale. In through the nose, hold it and exhale. So when we're breathing, we want to breathe slowly, rhythmically, and smoothly. That's the thing. So one of the questions last week is how do, how do we control ourselves? How do we how do we manage to control ourselves? Well, simple breathing techniques like this are a great help. Now a lot of people think, oh right, so I, I need to do this during the speech. No, don't don't do that during the speech. Yeah, obviously, you need to breathe during the speech, but you do the exercise. But a bit like a if you're a footballer or a cricketer, you do, you know, you spend your time out there doing your thing live, but you also spend a lot of time in training and in practice. And the, the, the thing about, so for example, when I was a young man, I was a very, you know, I was a very uh, keen footballer and thoroughly enjoyed it. So the secret was always to do the hard work in the training so that when you played, you had enough breath, you had enough strength. You had everything, you know, all of your resources at your fingertips, if you like. So that uh, the, the hard training, the hard yards are always done in training so that when you come to the playing, everything should look nice and rhythmic and smooth and you're not out of breath. And I would suggest that we do that. Uh, if you can do five minutes rhythmic breathing like we just did a moment ago, that's a great help. If you can do five, 10 minutes a day I can guarantee that will fuel you. It will make you feel really good because you're going to get that oxygen up in your head, up in your brain where you need it. And it's going to make you feel strong. It's going to make you feel in control of what you're doing. So it's like driving the car. You know, when, when we sit behind the wheel of the car, we don't want to be in a bad mood. We don't want to, we don't want to be in an argument with somebody either on the phone or in the, in the car itself, we want everything. We want ideal situation, yeah, and an ideal environment. So, as a speaker, you can create your own ideal environment by your planning, preparation, your practice. And one thing that I found incredibly useful, and as I said earlier, is the cornerstone of good speaking. I believe is your breathing. So, by breathing deeply, just hold it for there for about five seconds. And then we exhale. Now, generally, you don't need to make that sound. I'm just, I'm just doing the shh to demonstrate that that's the exhalation breath. So here's, here's a good technique. If you're, if you're in one of those meetings and you know that you are going to be speaking in, say, 10, 15 minutes or so, and... Uh, each speaker is getting closer to you, it's getting closer to you and uh, your anxiety is growing, what you can do is start breathing. So we call it square breathing. So you breathe in for five seconds through the nose, hold for five seconds, and then you exhale for five seconds through the nose, sorry, through the mouth rather, and then you pause for five seconds. And if you do that, for a minute, you'll do. You'll go through that cycle three times, and uh, there are two benefits. One, you get the oxygen, which is what we've just been discussing, so that's a good thing. And secondly, if you're counting, if you're counting those fives, it's very difficult to be concentrating on the anxiety of speaking. So it virtually acts like a placebo, plus you get the oxygen. So it's a really good distract distraction 
technique and it just takes your mind off what you have to say. So generally, hopefully you're, you're already planned and prepared and you know what it is that you want to say. So let's do another exercise. I'm, I'm going to sit down because uh, I, I need to stay in, in picture. So if, you're, if you could all stand up, that would be very, very useful. And what I'm going to ask you to do is just sway, just sway from side to side. This is a very simple exercise. Look at DP. DP's doing a great job there. We, we're going to do some exercise videos, I think, DP, me and you. Okay. So this is a very simple exercise just to open up the upper body because uh, you've got, so in your head, we, we have what we call three head resonators. You've got your nasal cavity, your mouth, and your throat. And they're called resonators because air gets trapped in there and it vibrates. And that's what I was saying about your voice. Your voice is a vibration. Now, if I pinch my nose, uh, the air that generally gets uh, vibrating in my nose there, you can tell the whole dynamic of my voice has changed because it's not vibrating in its normal default pattern. So when I release my nose there, now it's back to normal. And you can see that your voice, the whole, the whole pitch of your voice there changes remarkably. And it's the same with your voice. You, Put your hand across your mouth, that's difficult, uh, different as well. Uh, don't try and speak while you're being choked. That's not, that's not helpful. So any, if, if in any way you encumber those three head resonators, it will change the quality and the dynamic of your voice. So those are, that's what we call head resonators. But the major resonator is your lungs. So in your chest here, your lungs, an average, um, an average guy has about 14 liters of lung capacity. So when we breathe in deeply, when we really inflate our lungs here and uh, down at the bottom, you have a muscle called the diaphragm. When you inflate those muscles and your lungs, wow, you've got this massive resonating chamber and a really good voice. If you think of your, your voice, as that vibration, but your lungs effectively are the engine room of your voice because they're, very, they're, they're huge, they're large. Your three head resonators by comparison are very thin, they're relatively narrow and they're mostly high pitched. So if I talk like that, this is what we call a head voice and everything's coming out of my head. But now I've got more, more chest in my voice and generally, it's better to speak from the chest than have a high-pitched voice. So I would always prefer you to speak from the chest. Uh, it's, it makes it easier for the audience. I think, you know, for example, if you're a politician and you have a high-pitched voice like this, nobody's going to vote for you because they won't take you seriously. People with richer, deeper, more resonant voices uh, tend to do very well uh, when it comes to elections. So just really think about getting more if you the first thing you can do if you're not happy about the quality of your voice is get more chest into your voice and and all we do there is we just take a deep breath in inflate those lungs and then we we have more energy more punch more drive in the voice if you're always running it's a bit like running your car if you're running out of gas if you're running out of petrol and the car is spluttering it's, it's a great analogy. It's a, such an accurate analogy. So really think about inflating your lungs. Get more energy, get more volume, more drive, more punch into the voice. And then you can enjoy your voice a little bit more. So some very, very simple things there. Again, just, just anatomy and physiology related. And we can, we can change the quality of our voice by making some very small changes but uh, just one big point about breathing is a lot of people dismiss breathing and the reason they dismiss breathing is they say well I'm breathing anyway I'm breathing all of the time anyway and of course hopefully that's true now interestingly when you breathe we have what we call conscious breathing and unconscious breathing most of the time we're breathing unconsciously 
And when you breathe unconsciously, you're only using about two thirds of your lung capacity. When we breathe consciously, when I ask you to take a really deep controlled breath, and you inflate the lungs and your diaphragm here, you're getting an extra 20 to 30% hit of oxygen. Now that blood and oxygen gets redistributed around your body in, within seconds. That oxygen hits your brain and that's where we want to be. Now, quick question. Has anybody, had, uh, anybody ever had a panic attack? Because panic attacks are often uh, related with public speaking. And if you had a panic attack, you'll know about it because your hands go clammy, your, you start sweating, your heartbeat increases. Uh, we feel a tightness and a dryness in the throat when we're trying to speak. We generally feel quite sick, quite nauseous. And uh, some people complain, they say they get butterflies. And what's actually happening here in this panic attack is uh, adrenaline has been released on top of your kidneys you have what we call adrenal glands. And all it takes is a signal from a small part of your brain, a tiny part of the brain called the amygdala, sends a signal through your central nervous system at 400 miles an hour. So it arrives on the top of your kidneys in a fraction of a second. The moment it starts releasing adrenaline into your bloodstream, that's when you have that sense of nausea and you're having the, the signals there of a, of a panic attack. The secret, if you want to be a good speaker, is not to allow the panic attack to happen. And the easiest way, the best way, is by controlling your breathing, doing these exercises, doing the breathing exercises regularly. And as I say, just like any athlete would, before they go out and do their discipline, they do the hard work in the training, okay? So really think about your breathing. It's, uh, yes, we're breathing all the time, but that's, that's unconscious breathing. We want to breathe consciously. We want to get that extra 20 to 30%. And we want to take control of ourselves and we want to take control of the moment. And we want to take control of those messages that you're delivering in your speech. And they're going to come out better. They're going to come out with a greater resonance. They're going to come out with a greater conviction. Now, if you ever hear anybody talk and you don't find that there's any conviction behind those words now and again i'll try i'll try and demonstrate that later when i do some i could do some shakespeare for you now um to be or not to be that's the question it is not going to mind to suffer those things now is about outrageous fortune take arms against the sea of troubles and you know what that's just me reciting words but there was no passion there's no conviction behind those words to be or not to be that is the question whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die to sleep no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. This is a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die to sleep. To sleep perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity for so long life. Okay, so that's Shakespeare. It wasn't me. The beauty, the idea as a speaker, as a speaker in training, is that you take the words of somebody else, like Shakespeare or any other playwright that you really admire, and you make those words become real to the best of your ability. Now, if you're an actor, you don't become an actor uh, in one one hour session. Uh, it's a, it's a, in England, it's like a three or four year course. So uh, there's a lot of work, a lot more work involved as well. But it all starts with the voice. So, DP, could you, is the, the first document up, please? And just, yeah. Okay, and could you, yeah, uh, first document that is general, no? Okay, put general document up, that's fine. Okay, so what I'd like you to do at home is, is just follow me. And in the first two lines there, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got hope and roll. So these are words 
with the O sound. Now, the, the O, you know about words, I'm sure you know about words. So words are made up of consonants and vowels. And generally, you can tell somebody, certainly English people are very, very good at understanding where people come from simply by their accent, because how we, consonants are regular hard sounds. Vowel sounds are malleable. They, they can change. So if you want to speak really good, precise English, the quality of your vowel soundings are very important. So if you just want to follow me and see how this goes. So hope, roll, focus, those, both, clothes, bold, open, whole, road, oak, coat, glow, sorrow, pillow, follow, sparrow, throw, and sow. So is everybody trying that at home? Ask them, ask them are they trying that at home, DP? Yeah, uh, they are all listening to you, so they will all follow you. I want, okay, but I want, I want them to, I, I want them to, I'll put a space between, between that. So Joan has a cold in her nose because she rode her pony through the frozen snow. So as you can see there, there's a lot of O's in that sentence. And the idea is to get the O sound as accurate as possible. Joan has a cold in her nose because she rode her pony through the frozen snow. The poetry of bold poems imposed a strange tone on the whole show. I don't know when I will come home, although I'm closely focusing on the road, but soon most probably I will know and will phone as I come closer to your home. When speaking on the podium, keep your shoulders open. Joe, don't go to Oklahoma and Ohio but come home to Rome. So lots of those sounds there. Now, this next one, um, it's a little poem. It's a bit of a silly poem, but that's fine because the most important thing is producing the correct sounds. So Moses supposes his toeses are roses, but Moses supposes erroneously. For nobody's toeses are poses of roses as Moses supposes his toeses to be. So, these are, again, just, a, just a simple exercises that you could practice at home. But the, the key here th is to get the, the O sound. So the next one, Japanese. Barrage. Bad. Now, bad has got three letters, and you need to sound the B, the A, and the D. Bad. If you don't pronounce all of those, those letters, it will be indistinct. And that means that people, when you speak, won't be always be able to understand what you're saying. The purpose of communication is to try to speak as accurately as you can so that people can understand you. If understanding doesn't happen, communication hasn't happened. So always we want to try to be as accurate as we possibly can with our vowel soundings. So Japanese, barrage, bad, nationalities, happened, land, understand, activity, prank, miraculous, panther, ragged, man, actually. Okay, could you just scroll up a little uh, deeply? Thank you, okay. So here's a very interesting um, one. And again, this is really important in English because a lot of meaning is expressed through, through vowel soundings. So I was working with a Russian lady a few years ago and we just pronounce, we, we're just going to compare two sounds. So if you look at man and men, man and men. So man means one man. Men can mean two or more men. But if you can't get the vowel sound accurate between man and men, it will be indistinct. 
And uh, this very, very, very charming Russian lady, she just said, I can't, I can't get that distinction between the ah uh and the eh. So man, man, beg, bag, guest, guest, pet, pat, fed, fad, ten, tan, hem, ham, said, sad, hetero, hand, breath, bandage, ren, rank, kettle, candle. And the next line that says mess, mass, bend, band, bread, brand, set, sat, led, land, together, gather. And some of the words there, good words, moraine, beluga, banana, solution, lament, towards. So the more accurate we are with, with our articulation, the easier it makes for our listeners, yeah, our audience, effectively. The black fat cat was sad when he couldn't grab a slice of ham. It can be quite a challenge to manage a marriage. A man who looked unhappy sang a sad, bad, mad romantic song. Okay, can you go down, please, sir? Thank you. As a habit, I add some tomato to my hamburger. As a habit, I add some tomato to my hamburger. Standing hand in hand, the man asked Jan for her hand in marriage. Now, what we want to do, and I, I find these exercises incredibly useful because what we're trying to do is, we, if we speak in the, with the same pattern all of the time, it becomes very repetitive and that makes it's very difficult for the audience as well. So what we want to do is change the pitch and the voice, uh, the pitch and the voice, the pitch and the voice, the pitch and the pace as well. So we, and we can change the volume. As a habit, I add some tomato to my hamburger. Now that was very dramatic. Now if I was an actor, I'd be very proud of that. Standing hand in hand, the man asked Jan for her hand in marriage. So. So with the longer sentences there, you find a rhythm. And I think what, what good actors do and what good speakers do is they look for the rhythm in the words and they have some fun with it. Standing hand in hand, the man asked Chan for her hand in marriage. Now, I don't know how uh, popular radio is in, uh, in India, but I would imagine with a huge population, it's very popular. But imagine if the radio announcers don't do anything with their voices. Now, I know that India is a cricket mad country, and I want you to imagine that you're listening to England versus India, perhaps, on a test match, and it's very, very close. It's the final day of the test match, and either England could win or India could win. How do you think the commentators would be describing the scene well i think it would be they would be very very excited because you know these guys they're professionals they they want to win the game and of course the the people the commentators they're professionals as well and it's their job to create excitement otherwise nobody's going to listen so we need to really you know in a situation like that where it's very close and every ball was make or break to the outcome. Yeah. Now I remember last year I was listening to the, um, the 2020 uh, World Cup final and I was listening to it on, uh, on the radio because I couldn't bear to watch it. And it was just so brilliantly described by the commentators. They made it sound incredibly exciting. And I watched it, I recorded it, and I watched it later um, on TV, but it wasn't half as exciting as it was on the radio because you, of course, have to create the vision. So this bowler's bowling to this batsman, and if you know who those people are, uh, then you're creating those images in your mind. So this is why radio is very, very popular still, uh, and it evokes imagery in your brain, which is wonderful, which is what the brain is, is useful for. So here's, a, again, just a very useful exercise, and just follow me, and you'll see those Ws there. So we're going to go 
wa 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 wa. Then we're gonna go wa 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 wa. Now, what are we doing here? We're building some frequency. We're building rhythm. Wax, work, wolf, wait, want, watch, weather, whale, wheel, weather, wet, west, wind, went, worse, wire, while, wine, and whim. Will you be required to work in Westwood on Wednesdays? I wondered if any one of you were willing to acquire our exquisite wines. The qualitative results were not what we wanted from our quantifiable questionnaire questions. Everyone would want to have as a wife, a wondrous wise woman with beautiful eyes. A Welshman with Wellington boots wandered into the wonderful woods. Will you? Will you wait? Will you wait for Willie? Will you wait for Willie and Winnie? Will you wait for Willie and Winnie Williams? Could you just go down a bit, uh, DP? Okay, so these are, these are what we call tongue twisters. And the idea of a tongue twister is you get your tongue into the correct position to create the correct sound. So coming back to the, what I was saying earlier about being articulate, when we get those, those syllables and consonants out nice and crisply, that helps the audience to understand. So virtually everyone voted to leave the village undeveloped. Ralph was rough and tough, but also fearless and frank. Round and round the rugged rock, the ragged rascal ran. In spring, Rome is really rather pretty. Rose Rochester's role embraces preparation of the role profiles for regional sales reps. So you'll see there's lots of repetition. In this one, there's a, there are a lot of R's. I rather prefer prawns on rye bread to greasy pork with gravy and rice. Riding around the racetrack, Robert ran over a horrid brown rat. Okay, DP, it's 10 to four, time has flown. Could, uh, could you ask your, your guys if they got any questions? Because uh, in the documents that you sent them, maybe some of the answers might be there for them. So if you could just ask sure, them if they got any questions. Sure, sure. Uh, I think, sir, all are uh, listening to you. So uh, sir is requesting that if anyone has any question regarding uh, whatever we have discussed so far, so uh, we can have a quick question and sir will be answering those questions. And if there is no question, then we'll proceed further. So sure. I'll, just, I'll just wait for one minute. And uh, then if we have any questions, so uh, I mean, sir, sir, you answer those questions. Uh, sir, you may proceed. If they have any questions, so I can just... Uh, uh, I okay. Just, uh. Fingers crossed they'll come through. Okay, so I, I, I speak a few languages. I speak French and Spanish and a little bit of Portuguese. And I know that when I practice those languages, uh, there's, there's an accent that doesn't really go well with an English accent. So you have to, I like listening to, to texts. I like listening to audio books. There's, there's just so much great material on uh, YouTube these days. And I listen to natural speakers and I try and get my accent close to somebody who I like, or at least I find easy to understand. And you might, uh, again, you might do the same with, with English. I know, I know English isn't, um, um, you know, a native language for you all, although you may have, uh, you know, brought, been brought up with it, but you, pro you probably speak one or two other, lang you know, Indian languages as well. So, and if you're not in a position, if you're not in a job where you speak English all day, every day, uh, it's very easy to forget words and pronunciation as well. My wife is Brazilian. And uh, she speaks beautiful English, but she says that she has forgotten lots of words in Portuguese because she doesn't, she hasn't used them for many years. Uh, she, she just go back to Brazil and see her family. But if you're not using words regularly, it's easy to forget them. It's also easy to forget their, their meaning sometimes. So 
if you want to to learn somebody else's language just find somebody who you think is doing a really good job somebody that you can listen to comfortably and understand and other natural native speakers understand and perhaps not copy but certainly model some of the success criteria that those people create and i think that what i've found very useful over over my years of experience is working on these exercises developing the voice developing rhythm enjoying the exercise uh, we we again we've only scratched the surface today there's so many things that we we could talk about this and uh, again dp sometime in the future if you want to ask me back we can do some more of this because this is really benefit i believe this is one of the best and most beneficial exercises that you can do to to know that when you say something uh, in in a second or maybe third language that you're going to be understood so the closer you get those uh, sounds as accurate as you possibly can that's going to give you greater confidence so i'd really really uh, think about that because i think it, it certainly works so we've got some more uh, we've got some t's down there so t -t 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 -t. so th the like the, in english there are lots of words that begin with the the so the there um them now this is a, a very interesting construction the th and this is one if you're french if french people find this very difficult to speak in english because they don't have a natural th sound in French. So we have this thing, we call it muscle memory. And the idea of a, a tongue twister is to create, is to get the tongue into the correct position to create the sound. So just like if you go to the gym and you work out regularly, your, your muscles become accustomed to those exercises and they get strengthened. Now, if you've not got a TH sound in your language, you're gonna be relatively new to this and you need to, to practice and regularly get your, uh, your tongue into the correct position, which will create the correct sound. And- May, uh, may I, uh, I'm just sorry to interrupt, sir. Of One course. question is from Mr. N.G. Srinivas. He's from, sure. uh, I think, Southern part of India. Uh, his question is that how to use to through speaking to the words and sentence. Could you say that again, please, DP? Uh, I just yeah. lost you for a moment. Yeah, his question is that how to use to through speaking to the words and sentence. How do you use to tos? Uh, yeah, how to use through speaking to the words and sentence. He has how written... do you choose the words? Yeah. Gosh, how do you choose the words? Well, I, I guess it's, first of all, something I would suggest, and, and I hope I, I practice what I preach, and that is uh, when, when I'm speaking, even in England, even when I'm at, uh, you know, when I'm working in London, I always try to keep my language as simple as possible. Uh, Churchill was very good in his speeches at using the shortest and most simplest words. And, and there's a good reason for that, especially with globalization, because, you know, we have this thing called the internet now and lots of people have uh, websites. And what's very important is you understand your audience. Now, in London, you know, in, in, in England and London particularly, we have a really wonderful cosmopolitan audience. We have people from all over the world. And we have lots of international visitors, just like when I met DP a few years ago. And the interesting thing about that is, um, I don't, when I first met DP, I didn't know how, how well he spoke English. I don't know how often he got to practice his English or indeed any of the other colleagues in class. I had no idea, but they came from all different parts of the world and English wasn't necessarily their first language. So um, don't, please don't take this in a patronizing way. What I always do in London, because we have a, a very large international audience, is I always try to use very straightforward, small and straightforward everyday words. And the reason for that is mo more people will understand them. My wife, as I mentioned, is Brazil. 
uh, it's from Brazil. And she said to me one day, I was talking to my brother on the phone and she said that she didn't understand a word that I was saying. And uh, the implication of that to me sounded like I was trying to exclude her from the conversation with my language, but that wasn't true. You know, it's just that uh, I've known my brothers for 60 years and we have certain uh, themes and ways of speaking, which we, are, we have grown familiar with over the last 60 years. So I wasn't really trying to keep my, uh, my wife out, but it was just a very interesting comment from her that she didn't understand the language that I was using, although for me, that was everyday language. And, and as my wife is a, a really great student of English and a really wonderful international student, um, it, it made me think, did I, when I was in class, did I ever use language which I unexpectedly excluded the audience from? And that, that, I think that helped me enormously. So in answer to the question, when you're choosing your words, especially if you're talking to a you know, global audience and, and a lot of that audience may not have English as their first language, if you want people to understand you, just try and use words that are very, very simple. In fact, I got some very good advice from my wife. She said, Vincent, if you use language which isn't in the Cambridge 2 exam, which is a, an internationally required sort of standard, I believe. Uh, it's got about 2,000 core words, and, and they're, but they're every day, they're high profile words. They're, they're high frequency words, words that we use every day. So again, an interesting thing, um, if you can speak a thousand words in a second or a third language, you can probably communicate to a good, to a good extent, but it, it will be limited. Naturally, the more vocabulary you acquire over a period of time, you'll be able to speak more fluently. But uh, as my wife said, if, uh, if I don't use everyday expressions, if I don't use everyday words, if I use long words that she wouldn't understand because we don't use them regularly, communication will not happen and I'll, uh, I'll have a very unhappy wife. So uh, for me, just keep things very simple use shorter everyday words and uh, and enjoy the process. So that would be my answer. Okay, sir. thank you. Uh, we may proceed, sir. We, you can proceed. Okay, well. Uh, if I get any question in between, I'll just interrupt in between. Yes, of course, please do. So, um, where were we? So Stephen vainly viewed vast veils with vacant eyes. So the V sound is a, uh, for some languages, it's a difficult sound, so getting that V. There are many varieties of verdant vegetation on our veranda, said Guru. Three filthy looking thieves were hiding in the thickets of thorny thistle bushes. The author revealed the uncouth truth in his latest thriller. Thelma thought that theocratic speaking was thrilling. Now, um, again, some of this language is getting slightly more complex here. But these are just for, these are just exercises, which would introduce you to the the words as well. Arithmetical theorems come from thorough thinking of enthusiastic arithmeticians. Have we got any arithmeticians on? Any mathematicians? That's a good uh, that's a good tongue twister. One wealthy author only wrote the truth, and not filth. Oh, by the way, um, there's one thing I wanted to say, DP, and I'm going to send you the document straight after the call. We. Because of time, um, I would have liked to have done more exercises with you, but uh, I have a document. I'd recorded about 40 videos in the last few years doing breathing exercises and these vocal variety exercises as well. So what I propose to do is send that to you, to your, to you and if you could distribute those uh, to today's audience, I would really appreciate that. And oh, definitely, what, sir. I, I'll definitely what, distribute. Thank you. And what they can do is they can go through the, the documents that I sent and they can go through the videos and the videos and the documents, you'll be able to, to work out which is the correct exercise. Once, you, once you've watched the exercises on the video, you'll, and, and you, if you look through the documents that I sent earlier, you'll be able to work out which are which. And you can just see me in action and then you can practice in your own time at home. So I hope that will be really grateful to all. Okay, and well, that, that, will be, that will be my pleasure. 
So the medicine is soothing for my rather sore back. I would rather buy this leather hat than that one with the feathers. My mother and father adore my younger brother for being rather smarter than I. That brown leather coat is made of a smoother leather than the black one in the window. The suddenly wind blew this way and that across the Scottish heather. So we've got lots of interesting sentences. And again, these, these sentences, the idea of a tongue twister is that it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's just a means of using the same letter multiple times very quickly and getting your tongue into position so that you can create the correct sound. So I'm just going to run through the, the next uh, six lines there. So taught, trick, tin, note, mat, trade, wet, thought, thick, thin, north, mouth, thread, half, thanks, three, third, thought, thumb, thing, thin, bath, breath, cloth, tenth, sixth, truth, both, author, arithmetic. So they've all got that TH sound there, and it's slightly different in each of them. Moraine, beluga, banana, solution, lament, buddy, tough, front, rough, couple, duck, bud, punch, stuck, must, luck, dump, just, upper, none, bus, lunch, come, worry, front, love, done, once, cover, rough, country, couple, double, trouble. Now, something very interesting about that little exercise is that just doing that exercise, I can really feel my jaw working very hard. And another good uh, exercise that you can do is exaggerate the lip movements. Taught, trick, tin, note, and if you exaggerate the lip movements, it slows the delivery down, but it helps the formation of the correct sounds. So by slowing it down, and it really makes your jaw work, and it makes your lips go up and down. And this is very, very useful, because if you, I'm gonna talk for a moment and I'm not gonna open my mouth. So it's gonna be a little bit like that. And what happens is if you don't open your mouth, the, the language becomes very indistinct and uh, it's not very good. But when you move your lips up and down and you allow the sound to come out of your mouth, that makes it much clearer, much more distinct, much more articulate. And I'm hoping that that's what you want to achieve uh, with your speaking and, uh, and with your communication generally. So, okay, I think, I think we're done for today, uh, DP. I'll be very happy to do another session with you sometime down the road. Uh, but like I said, I think I'll send you those videos. Sure, and if, anybody's, if anybody's got any questions, again, I'd love to answer them. I think uh, it's again, the, the hour, our hour has gone so quickly and we've only- uh, Yeah, it has gone really, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, means uh, now uh, the session is open for question and answer. Sir is ready uh, to receive the question and accordingly he will be answering. So may I request now the participants to please uh, just uh, uh, enter your question in chat box if you have any question. So sir is ready to answer those questions. Uh, one question is again from Mr. N.G. Srinivas. He's asking about the uh, practice timing. He's asking to suggest the practice timing. Uh, what should be the general timing for practice? Okay. I think, I think it, it would very much depend on, on how confident you are with your English. If you're new to English, for example, and, and you're just learning the, uh, you know, the, the soundings of the letters, the phonics of the letters, uh, you might want to do a little bit more. But generally, I would say if you're if you're reasonably confident with your English and you want to achieve a greater level of articulacy, I would say ten minutes a day. Just just work through the examples, work through these um, these papers that DP has sent you, and look at the videos. And I'll send you a link to the video. And if you've got any questions, we can we can go through any further questions you have next time. But I think if you can do 10 minutes a day, now the thing, the very important thing to remember 
is that um, we all have speech patterns. So I'm from Manchester. And when I moved to London, uh, some people used to comment on my accent. Uh, they didn't like it. And what I've done over the last 30 years is I've lost, well, not that I had a, I don't even believe I had a strong accent in the first place, but what I've tried to do, because I'm now working with a very cosmopolitan, multinational audience all the time, I'm trying to speak as accurately as I possibly can. So Again, I think in the early days, I would spend 10 minutes a day, naturally, you know, being English being my, my first language, I was confident with, with the language itself. But the, the more you practice these exercises, the stronger your voice becomes, the more fluent you become, the more confident you become. And I'm, I'm proud to say that wherever I go, and uh, my public speaking has taken me all over the world, uh, I've always been, always received a very, very warm welcome wherever I go. So that, that suggests to me that people think I'm doing an okay job. So if, if they're okay, I'm okay. If they're okay with me, I'm okay as well. So that's, uh, I would say 10 minutes a day if you're comfortable with the language initially. Oh, that's really great, sir, to receive uh, uh, your answer. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, so far, I have not received any other question. But, okay, uh, I've just got one, one further point I want to make with, with that, DP, please, and that is that if you have um, a speech pattern, let's say, let's say you're 25 years old or 45 years old, uh, you will have developed that speech pattern over the course of your life. The reason we want to do 10 minutes a day and you need to do it for at least six weeks just to make some really good impression here is that when we're not just talking about a speech pattern you're talking about a neurological pattern as well you've created that that pattern in your in your neurons and it's very easy to slip back if you don't practice it regularly if you don't change that pattern if you never change that pattern you will inevitably slip back to where you were at the outset so I would suggest that six weeks, 10 minutes a day, but, but have practice, have fun with it, really enjoy yourself. It will give you greater confidence in the way you speak and communicate. And the, for example, I was doing my Shakespeare earlier, that, that speech, the Shakespeare speech, the to be or not to be speech, it's one of the most famous speeches in the world. And it gives you so many opportunities to express the spoken word and as I mentioned earlier there, there are short uh, phrases there are medium length phrases there are very long sentences and the idea is to have this you know energy right the way throughout that speech and to interpret the words that maybe Shakespeare that you'd make Shakespeare proud with so interestingly if you look at YouTube and, and just type in to be or not to be you'll see great actors all delivering the same speech but observe how they're all doing it differently they're they're interpreting it differently and some do it very softly and very slowly and some do it a little bit harder with their words um either way it's beautiful so long as you do it in a sincere way and i think i think that's that's where the truth can possibly happen if what you're doing is sincere, but you need to be properly, you know, fully aligned with that yourself. So I hope, I hope that helps. Um, it certainly helped me. Yeah, I got another question, sir, if you allow, I can oh, Sure, that. of course, yeah. Uh, that uh, the question is from Mr. Manjes M. He's, uh, his question is that how to improve our vocabulary? Is there any shortcut? Is there any secret to- Shortcut, shortcuts. Any shortcuts? Wow, uh, I'm, I'm just looking at my bookcase in front of me here and the book directly ahead of me is called Word Power. So there are, now do you remember what I was saying a few moments ago? I think what's really useful is to speak in a very simple everyday way, to use words that a huge international audience would, would know and expect, okay? I repeat, 
I think it's useful to have a great vocabulary because some people will use long words. Now, again, um, for example, if you're a doctor, there is a lot of jargon. There's a lot of medical jargon. If you work in IT, like I used to work in IT, there's a lot of jargon. If you work in law, there's a lot of legal jargon. What we want to do, uh, if you're speaking to a lay audience, that is a, an audience who don't come from a, a particular technical background, you want to make language as simple and as accessible to them as possible. So I think word, uh, books like this, Word Power, are very useful. It introduces you to, again, some very strong uh, words that you, you would, you know, if you read reports or if you read the newspaper, you'd certainly find uh, these words in here. So that's, that's one way. I, I, I'm not sure that there are any shortcuts. I mean, learning is learning. I think 30 years ago, they were experimenting with uh, people, trying to get people to learn in their sleep, trying to cram knowledge into their, their brain waves while they were sleeping. I don't think that worked. So I don't think there's a shortcut, but I think the beauty of language is it's like a big jigsaw, how words fit together how words integrate and how they create meaning. So what I would suggest is the more familiar. So this book got a lot of great words in there. If you can integrate that into your daily patterns as soon as possible, that would be how I would do it. That would be certainly be how I would do it in French or Spanish by diving in and, and immersing myself in the language and having no fear about learning as much as I can when I get that opportunity. So that, that's how I, I would do it. Uh, I think always having great learning resources close to you, that was, that was just a great question. And I just reached over to my bookcase here and that book has been probably on that shelf there for 20 years and I've never, haven't looked at it since 1990 possibly. So it's just great. <clears throat> I think if you've got your own little library or your own learning resources, there are some great online courses as well uh, for, for vocabulary as well. But I think generally, you know, if you, I, I like the BBC websites, uh, but the, there are other good websites uh, like, um, like Sky and CNN. And what they will do is they'll introduce you to new vocabulary. If you can look at, uh, for example, the coronavirus, has introduced us to lots of new words and expressions. Um, I didn't know what PPE was until a couple of months ago, personal um, protection equipment. So we, we're learning all the time. We're not static, we're always learning. And just read, you know, read an entire article and just see if there are any words that you don't understand. And then that's where a good dictionary comes in. Just go and explore those words and um, come back to the sentence that you found them in and see if you can find the context of how that word uh, was used. And I think that would, that would uh, help enormously. So as I say, uh, my wife and I are very keen on French and Spanish and uh, we, we have, uh, I could reach up here and pull down a Spanish dictionary. Uh, I'll, I'm just gonna do it for you. Yeah. So again, it's, uh, Spanish. Having good, good learning resources around gives you confidence, I think. If, if, if I had to wait to go to the library to find out a word, uh, that, that would slow me down. So having good resources handy is a very a productive way of managing your time, I believe. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, can I take one more question, if you allow? Of course. Or, yeah, uh, another question is, uh, Again, from Mr. N.G. Srinivas, he's asking something related to written skill. How to improve written skills for our administration? Okay, very good. Now, um, there are some very good tools. Now, I, I'm in the process. Whilst whilst I'm uh, I'm on furlough and in lockdown in London, what I've been doing to manage my time, I've been writing a book and I'm using a tool and it's called Grammarly. And I find it very, 
very useful. So it, it's it's like a spell checker, but it also does a grammar check as well. And if you, we all have uh, favorite words like important and uh, erratic. That's one of my favorite words. Chaotic. And if you overuse words, what it will do is it will say you're 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 using this word too much, you know. And use another word. Use a similar word because in English, the great the great thing about English is that there's there's over a hundred thousand words, and those words have all come. Uh, from different countries, you know, we, we have stolen a lot of words from from other countries. Now, bungalow is an Indian word, I believe. Is that correct? Bungalow. Oh dear, just uh, just ignore the telephone. Uh, DP is bungalow an Indian word? Bungalow, yeah, yes. Sir. Yeah. So I think I think what happened was, uh, you know, we people uh, British people spent a lot of time in India. Um, in the last century and, uh, you know, the first half of the 20th century. And we, we take, we don't, re we don't create new words. We take words from other countries that already describe something that we're not familiar with. So the word bungalow. So houses in England, which are one story, we call them bungalows. So we, we stole that word from, from <laughs> Indian. Uh, but that, that's a good, it's a good thing, because the, the nice thing about English and, and the beautiful thing about metaphor as well and language is that the, the idea of the nice way, the nice thing about metaphor is that we can, I used the analogy earlier, I was saying about, uh, you know, driving the car and ascending the gears smoothly, and you can do the same with your voice, That's a, that was a, a metaphor, and you, there are lots of uh, so an, an analogy is a form of metaphor. It's a comparison um, between between two things. But if you compare two two of the same, then it's not really a comparison because they're both the same. So it, we we talk metaphorically. It's like this, but it's slightly different. Yeah. But people can see the connection. Yeah. So metaphor is very powerful as well. So can you just remind me of the question again? How do we, how did we? Uh, the question is the how to improve written skills for our administration. Right. Okay. So I use something called Grammarly. I found it incredibly useful. So it does uh, it does a word check. It does a spelling check, and it's very very good. There was there was a product called Hemingway, named after Ernest Hemingway, the great writer, the Nobel laureate. I used that some years ago, but I think Grammarly is very, very good. So if you're writing in English, uh, so it's got a huge database behind it. It's, uh, it's um, all runs on AI, you know, and machine learning, and it gets to know how you write. So if you've got a particular way of writing that it thinks isn't actually correct, it will let you know. And then you can, ch if you're happy with it, you can change it. So I, I think it, it really helps you. So like I said, I'm, I'm writing a book and we have this thing called the passive voice. So talk, talking in the past tense, putting things in the past tense um, or, or certain verb forms in the past tense. And it lets you know if, if there are too many in a, in a paragraph. And that's really good because you want, as a writer, you want to help your audience. You want to help your readers uh, enjoy what you've written and understand what you've written. And, you know, if there are any grammatical errors in what you've done, although they may, you know, if you spoke that way, nobody would say that was incorrect. So there's a difference between speaking and writing. I think when we're writing, because people these days don't have as much time as they used to. I think if we could, if we could write a book, if you write a book with 120,000 words, you could probably get, you could probably lose 20,000 of those words and, and still create the same meaning. And in doing so, uh, you would free up people's time and they'd probably enjoy it more as well. So if you can use a form of writing, which makes it quicker for people to, you know, to get to the point, I would use that tool. So it's called Grammarly. So Grammar, L-Y, Grammarly. And you can get a free version 
and there is a, like a professional version which has uh, you know extra add-on features and it's not it's not expensive i think it's about uh, 60 pounds a year so it's maybe maybe it's, you know a bit more than a pound a week so it's, it's a good it's a good tool to, to work alongside uh, especially if you're using it as much as i am at the moment so I, that's what i would do so thank you very much sir uh, for your valuable time and delivering a uh, talk and educating us about the different vocal development uh, development exercises it has really been uh, <clears throat> nice to interact with you and also get so many uh, misuseful information related to vocal development and uh, definitely as per your advice uh, we will keep working on those areas which you have suggested and uh, i guess all the participants who have been listening to you for uh, more than one hour they also will involve themselves to uh, uh, means learn or uh, improve the vocal development and uh, it has been really nice the time has passed very quickly and we really uh, did not realize that uh, how far it has gone so it means how fast it has gone and uh, yeah. sir we are really grateful to you sir that uh, you have joined us uh, from uh, you got i uh, mean uh, you set yourself free from your busy schedule and uh, you uh, joined us and educated us today and uh, we are hopeful that in future also or we will get your cooperation and uh, you will agree uh, to educate us uh, regarding this public speaking i will be delighted really it's been it's been uh, great fun i i lo i love talk i love being a public speaker and a trainer and an educator it's a great deal of fun uh, it's a, the, the the only sadness for me is that i can't be there with you that would be that would be even greater fun to be, to be with you and to meet you and uh, and to share uh, the same space but until next time whenever next time is i hope you're all staying well staying safe under the lockdown uh, criteria um, it's very difficult times for families very difficult times for the world at the moment and um, i hope i just hope that uh, everything gets resolved I, I pray every day for a for a vaccine or you know something that will take us from the grips of this terrible uh, disease so look after yourself stay safe and uh, you know keep in touch keep in touch with dp and i'll keep in touch with him and um, i'm very very happy to answer your questions or you know share any resources that i can so dp i'll be sending you that document in the next 30 minutes or so thank you sir definitely i'll i'll just share those documents with all the participants and once again on behalf of all the participants sir uh, I express my sincere thanks to you for joining us and educating us. Thank you, sir. Okay. Stay happy. Thank you. Thank my you pleasure, sir. chap. All the best. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.